Tonight on the Fifth Estate, he was only five when his parents decided they didn't want him anymore. I just remember packing my stuff and then being dropped off at this house. Handed to a complete stranger, arranged on the internet. It might be a very comforting way of saying trafficking in children. Tonight. It's unbelievable that anybody could be that inhumane with their child with a little boy. We go looking for answers. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Hi. How did a child get given away online? I'm Jillian Findlay. This is The Fifth Estate. <laughs> get it, get it, you tag. I got you, yeah, well. Well, you tag. And you can only grab one at a time. No. Dad. <laughs> it's a 13th birthday party, a coming of age. For the Gilbert family of Cowichan Bay, B.C., a chance to celebrate a young life that's already had far too many chapters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, three-day ceasefire. Three-day ceasefire. <laughs> he is a, has an incredible laugh that usually makes other people laugh as soon as they hear it. <laughs> <laughs> he has a great sense of humor. He's very sensitive. Um, he's very loving. <laughs> and um, I think that he is one of the most resilient and um, amazing kids I've ever met. <laughs> Moses Gilbert has had to be resilient. He started out life as Moses Tukpa, born in central Liberia in the middle of a bloody civil war. Like millions of Liberians, his family escaped to a refugee camp. More siblings were born, the family couldn't cope. In 2005, the decision was made to send Moses to an orphanage. Amos Kudo worked for the Christian missionaries who ran that orphanage, and he remembers the day Moses' father arrived with the four-year-old in tow. Then he explained his condition. He had three wives and a lot of kids, and he decided to give Moses up for adoption. And the process of adoption was explained to him, which he consented to and then Moses were taken to the orphanage. During the war, many Liberian children ended up in orphanages, whether they were truly orphans or not. Adoptions rose dramatically as North American couples in particular swooped in to save poor African children. <laughs> Nearly a decade later, Amos still has the orphanage ledger. The home would eventually be shut down for irregularities, but not before hundreds of children were dispatched to all parts of the U.S. and Canada. And not before a little boy named Moses would be called from the crowd and told that he, too, would be going to a new home far away. As you come down, you see no more 80 years Moses took back and he went to Canada. More specifically, he went to Castlegar, Canada, arriving in the B.C. interior just before Christmas. Lab supervisor Ian Johnson and his wife Carol had jumped through all the regulatory hoops, paying a private agency to arrange the adoption. They already had two children, an older biological son and a baby they'd also adopted. Moses was to fit in between. And back in Liberia, the first reports had them smiling. We got a picture that he was uh, uh, skinny on the uh, snow. We would not have in Liberia. But we saw Moses doing that, and the African child would be so excited in that, we were happy for that. There were adjustments to be sure, but initially the Johnsons reported Moses as thriving. In an interview with Adoption Magazine, they described him as bright and eager to try new things, fundamentally a gentle child. But by the spring of 2006, their story was beginning to change. Moses, they said, was becoming disruptive, and according to them, the agency that arranged the adoption was proving no help. And so the family turned to BC's child welfare authorities. Government social workers moved in to support the family and to investigate the parents' claim that the boy they'd once described as gentle had become violent. 
The fifth estate has obtained some of the notes written by those social workers detailing just what the Johnsons were saying. Not only was Moses willful and destructive playing with knives, they say he admitted killing a child, choking her to death in Liberia. They also claim he tried to drown another child in the Castlegar swimming pool. All of this from a boy who had yet to turn five. And yet the Johnsons said they were so afraid for their other children, they put a bell on Moses' bedroom door so they could hear him come out. As for what explained the behaviors, bizarre as it seems, they concluded that Moses had to have been a child soldier in Liberia. Amos Kudo says that's impossible. So was Moses ever a child soldier? No. no. Our war in Liberia ended in 2003 and Moses was born in 2001. That is not possible. For any child to be two years to be a fighter at that time. But logic didn't seem to be in the driver's seat. By the summer of 2006, the Johnsons were so worried, they took Moses to Vancouver to a group that helps victims of torture. As Moses played, a social worker talked to Mrs. Johnson, who, according to notes, asked Moses to demonstrate how to choke someone, like he had in Liberia. When the boy showed no sign he knew what his mother was talking about, Mrs. Johnson told him to watch as she acted out to choke someone, using her own hands and holding her neck very tight. According to the notes, Mrs. Johnson asked Moses questions. What did you do after you killed her? How did she die? Each question was followed by a reward of hugs and kisses. Moses may well have been traumatized in Liberia, but the social worker concluded the more immediate problem was Mrs. Johnson, who prompted Moses, graphically insisted on his demonstration of violence, possibly implanting false memories. In late September, Moses was admitted to Vancouver Children's Hospital for another assessment, and doctors diagnosed him with chronic PTSD, among other things. What was becoming clear is that this was a boy who was going to need help long term. What was also becoming clear, the Johnsons were no longer willing to provide it. In October, the Choices Adoption Agency in Victoria got a call from Carol Johnson. Sandra Scarth was Choices Executive Director. She was pretty frantic and it was clear that this adoption wasn't going to hold and so she really didn't want him going into foster care. But what Carol told her next left her speechless. She said she'd been on the internet, had found forums, chat rooms, a whole community of people posting ads about adoptions gone wrong. Carol decided to post her own ad. The intent was clear. Her five-year-old boy was available if anyone wanted him. A response didn't take long, and it came from a woman in Houston, Texas. What was your reaction? I was taken aback initially. Yeah. Until had she you ever heard of such a thing? No, I actually hadn't at the time. She had um, found this woman online and uh, was wanting to move him down there. And so our advice was, you can't do that. It's not legal. It's not ethical. And when you said to them, don't do this, mm -hmm. it's illegal, it's, it's unethical, what reaction did well, you get? Um, Mrs. Johnson kept pressing us, you know, what if I sent him down as a relative? Well, you aren't a relative. What if I sent him down as a friend? Well, you can't just do that with a friend. You need to know who this person is. You need to know that she's safe, basically. So that's the, that was the kind of conversation that we had. Garth tried to explain that if Moses was to be adopted again, there would be rules. Authorities in both Canada and the U.S. would have to be involved and it would take time. We would never, ever, ever encourage anyone to take a child and dump him in, in another place without all the protections that we would build into a regular adoption. So no one ever encouraged her to do that. But she did it anyway. When we come back. Are you Ambrosia Marvin? Yes. The woman who answered that internet ad all the way from Texas. Liberia, Moses Gilbert was just four and a half years old when he was adopted by Ian and Carol Johnson and brought to Canada. He was only five when they decided to rehome him to a woman they'd found on the internet. 
It was October 2006. Ian Johnson packed a suitcase, put Moses in the car, and drove from Castlegar, B.C. across the border to Spokane, Washington. From there, they flew to a place Moses had never heard of before, Houston, Texas, to meet a woman he'd never seen before at an airport hotel. Her name was Ambrosia Marvin, and she'd agreed that Moses could come and live with her. Eight years after that meeting, it took us months to find Ambrosia Marvin, but we eventually tracked her to California, to the tiny town of Hemet. Are you Ambrosia Marvin? Yes, I am. Hello. I'm Julia. Reluctant to talk at first, she agreed to meet us at a hotel. She told us she was a single mother, a part-time teacher who'd already raised two children, one from an adoption gone wrong. In 2006, she thought she wanted a third child, and so she started looking online. As a single person, I didn't have the money to go to China or go to the former Soviet Union or go to Africa. And I thought, well, then maybe I could find a child on the rebound. This was on the Yahoo Internet. group, just a Yahoo group. There are groups for everything under the sun, people who like classic cars, people who will fly airplanes, people who are interested in speaking Chinese. And there was a group for people who were looking to rehome their children after a disruption. Do you remember what that initial post was, what it said? Five-year-old boy, adopted from Africa, uh, families looking to rehome, situation is not working out. She told us she and the Johnsons emailed back and forth for several months. It was clear to her the family was struggling, and given her experience, she was pretty confident she could help. And that is how the deal to rehome Moses was eventually struck. Then the agreement was I would get temporary custody for six months. And at the end of six months, there would be an assessment. You know. And who was going to do that assessment? The parents and I, because they had legal custody. Of you him. would decide between the two of you whether this was well, the three of us. Based on nothing more than that, no screening, no home study, no involvement by professionals or authorities of any kind, Moses and his father met Ambrosia at that airport hotel. Moses was bouncing off the walls. He was jumping up and down on the bed the whole time and talking constantly. And he would fall off the bed and hit his head. And Ian said he would run into the wall all the time or bump his head. And Did he know what was happening? Did he know why you were all there? <sighs> at first, no. They had talked to him at home and told him that they didn't think, think where things were working out and that it might be better for him to live with another family. The plan was to spend the weekend to give Moses time to adjust. But just hours after they'd arrived, it became clear that even a weekend was going to be too long for Ian. He said, I don't think that I can let him go if I stay here till Sunday night, but I have no choice. Because it's going to uh, ruin our family, it's gonna ruin our marriage. Um, Carol isn't gonna let him come back. And so um, I think you should just take him tonight. And uh, Ian was unhappy, he was crying. He said, I wanna talk to Moses. So he went in there and he talked to Moses. And I could tell Moses was disturbed, but he didn't cry. And they said their goodbyes and Moses went with us. We were horrified, yeah, horrified. Adoption counselor Sandra Scarth had advised the Johnsons not to do it and couldn't believe they went ahead anyway. I mean, this just doesn't make sense. It, it's not, it's, it breaks all the kind of um, protections that you build into adoptions. I mean, you don't just take a child and dump them with strangers. And this person was basically a stranger. So what kind of a parent would do that? For months, Carol and Ian Johnson refused all our requests for an interview. We finally just went to their home in Castlegar. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Hi. My name's Jillian Finley. I'm with the Fifth Estate at CBC Television. Okay. How are you? Good. There's my card. I'd like to speak to you about Moses. I think what people want to know is why, when you ran into difficulties with Moses, you made the decisions you made to well, put him on the Internet, to well, take him to a stranger in the United well, States. There's no way we can tell our side of the story because people aren't going to understand it. People, some people will. But we're going to come up with just being bad guys, and that's true. You, know, you don't know how hard it was and how much, you know, 
stress and crying and decisions. And Having refused to talk to us for so long, he then spent the next hour and a half telling us the story, initially unaware our cameras were rolling, starting with the decision to adopt Moses in the first place. He went all the way to Africa yeah, to, to get his... I spent a month there. Yeah. Because we wanted another child. Yeah. And we thought, you know, um, there's these African kids that have nothing, who are in orphanage, who have no future. We wanted to help. We wanted to have another child, and we thought we'd have a, we had a five-year gap in our two kids. We thought we'd fit nicely in there. And they knew there would be issues, he said, but they were totally unprepared for what they say happened next. Totally off the record, he was threatening to kill our kids. Killed my wife, killed our kids. He pushed our kids. He had knives. I was sleeping on his bedroom floor because he was hiding knives in his bed under his mattress. This is a five-year-old boy. This is a little bit older than that. Yes, it is. Can you believe that? Nobody believes that. It was hard to believe, but he insisted it was true. His wife bore the brunt of it, he said, though she still refused to talk to us. He'd do stupid little things like, you know, like, like he knew how to go to the bathroom. He didn't go to the bathroom. He got worse. He knew how to do bath, how to go to the bathroom in Africa when he first got here. But by the time he left, he was in, in pull-ups. He was going in his pants. He went, he wouldn't go in the bathroom in the toilet. He would pee on the walls. He would but even, I'm not a psych himself even. I'm not a psychologist, but even I know that that's got to be an indication of him exactly. hurting. And what, and, what does, and, and what does the ministry say? It's in the minds of the parents. That's what we are getting. He then raised that assessment they got from the victims of torture group in Vancouver. This guy was saying, you know, Moses probably was involved with soldiers somehow. Because he, he knew how to hold a gun, and he talked about shooting, he talked about strangling a girl. He, he was two or three years old when he was... He was four was... or five, yes. I but mean, that's, but that's never, exactly. whatever, exactly, well, how, the number. I, I mean, you this, and you don't believe me. Who's going to believe me? Nobody believes us. I don't know if it's true. But he knew how to shoot a gun. He knew how, how to... How do you know that he... How did he know how to shoot a gun? How well, did you know that? Well, he... he we... Where, where, where were we at one time? He talked about it, and he, I can't remember where we had it, where yeah. there was a toy gun, and he picked it up, and he was... Yeah, but every little yeah, boy does I, that. I know, but... Yeah, see? I don't know. These yeah. little things add up. The report I saw questioned your and your wife's assessment of him. They, they said that they weren't sure that these behaviors yeah. were not more in yeah, the minds of the parents than... Exactly. Than... So that's what we were dealing with. We're, we are totally frustrated because these people are saying, you're imagining things. Yeah. And, and that, was the, that was the big issue, was they are saying, nothing wrong with this boy, and we're saying, come on. And so, with the stroke of a key, they agreed to give him to a stranger. This is Moses today. In eight years, he's rarely talked about that night in Houston, when the only father he'd ever really known handed him over to a woman he'd never met. The details are a bit hazy now, but he clearly hasn't forgotten the feelings. I don't remember very much because I was quite small. I remember being dropped off somewhere, but being dropped off at a house. You, but you remember being dropped off at a house? Yeah. I grabbed my stuff and uh, grabbed my stuff and leaving. So I remember packing my stuff and then being dropped off at this house. Right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you think about that at the time? I didn't really know what was going on, but... For a little guy, that must have been pretty scary. Yeah, yeah, I was scared, but I didn't know what was going on. Do you remember them telling you why they were dropping you at that house? No. <laughs> yeah, I remember them just telling me if we found a family for you and then driving over. When we come back, what happened to Moses has happened to other children, lots of them. And we found that on this one Yahoo group, a child was being offered up for rehoming on average once a week, every week going back five years.
have done our best, but we just cannot handle these issues. We've experienced problems since we've got the boys. Disruption. No fee. Handsome, obedient boy. Of all the promise of that great electronic marketplace, the internet, few could have imagined it becoming a tool for this. We must dissolve this adoption for our sanity. Praying for a new home for an adopted six-year-old boy. We've done our best, but it just was not enough. Adoptive parents giving away children they no longer want. The practice first came to light in the United States last year after a reporter stumbled into Yahoo and Facebook groups and discovered parents posting ads. Megan Tui is that reporter. She works for Reuters in New York City. You quickly learn the language. Um, their, you know, disrupted adoption is kind of the catch-all phrase to describe adoptions that are failing, where the family has decided that they need to remove the child from the home. Uh, Rehoming is the other term that I quickly learned, uh, which is a term first used by people trying to find new homes for their pets. Tui headed an online investigative team that spent a year and a half exploring those chat rooms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People won't know that you have the kid. <laughs> We built a database and, you know, scraped all 5,000 messages dating back five years, and we found that on this one Yahoo group, a child was being offered up for rehoming on average once a week, every week going back five years. And that was just in a single Yahoo group. So can you give me some examples of the kinds of stories yeah, you found? Yeah, so... You know, the subject here is need to find a family for eight-year-old girl from China. Unfortunately, we are now struggling having been home for five days. <laughs> Five days. Yeah. We have finally decided to attempt to find a new home for the girls, ages 8 and 10. They are wonderful girls 90% of the time. It's just that 10% is so awful. Mm. It makes you th wonder what these people thought yeah. they were going to, they were buying into, huh? Right. You've got um, somebody kind of complaining yeah. about what would seem to be pretty normal uh, frustrations that parents yeah. encounter. Um, you know, and so, you know, that raises questions about how committed those parents were to the children in the first place, I think. Such an easy decision for some parents, apparently. But what about the children? No one knows how many adopted kids have changed hands this way in Canada or the U.S. But in rural Wisconsin, we found Sam Steinhoff and his four younger brothers and sisters. My dad seems really happy. So that's my mom. So yeah, I like this picture. The kids arrived in the United States five years ago. Life was good in Ethiopia until their mother died and their father couldn't cope. They spent two years in an orphanage before an American couple decided to take them in, all five of them, all at once. It was great at first, you know. We all, we all got along. It was all fine, we played, but I don't know, they just changed. You know, I didn't want to have it there anymore. That was never more clear, he says, than on their first Christmas morning. I don't remember Christmas. They celebrated downstairs by themselves. We weren't a part of it. They didn't even give us presents, so, you know. Six weeks after they arrived, the adoption was over. One morning, Sam and his siblings were deposited in a McDonald's parking lot. I remember that they woke us up early in the morning, like, I think it was like three o'clock or some at night or in the morning, I mean. And then they just said, get ready and stuff. And then we just all went and that's how it was. Remarkably, it all worked out. The children ended up with a woman who taken in many kids from disrupted adoptions, including 18-year-old Addie, who also came from Ethiopia. I really didn't think this would come like this way it turned out. When Addie's adoptive parents decided they no longer wanted her, they turned to the internet. She passed through several different homes. The last time her father left her with a stranger, he promised her he'd be back in a week. I called, I said, Dad, are you going to come and pick me up? And he was like, no, that's, you're never going to come back. And that's your new home and that's your new family. I was like, what are you talking about? Because I had no idea that's going to, him saying that I have to live here. I was like, I started crying on the phone. I didn't know what to do. 
I really thought I want to die, seriously. There's the times that I, I, just, I just don't want to continue going every day. Addie suffered years of depression, and even though she's in a better place now, she knows she'll never get over the betrayal. He signed, his wife too, they signed so many sheets in Ethiopia. They said they would not give up. They said they will always be there until she's an adult. And they never followed their, their promise. You know, that raises questions about how... Most of the children Megan discovered in those internet chat rooms did end up in better homes. But perhaps predictably, she also found cases of exploitation and abuse. You know, we found a case where there was a woman who advertised a 10-year-old boy that she had adopted and decided that she didn't want any more. And by that afternoon, she was handing him off to um, a man and a woman. And, you know, that man is now in prison for uh, child pornography. Um, that woman had had her own biological children permanently removed from her custody because she had been found to be abusive and neglectful. So how is this all allowed to happen? Whose job is it to ensure that it doesn't? Well, as shocking as it seems, in both the U.S. and Canada, there is no requirement to follow up with children adopted from overseas. No obligation on the private agencies that arrange the deals. And in Canada, with the exception of Quebec, no responsibility on the provinces, even though they're the ones that issue all the permits. What's perhaps even more shocking is that once the children are here, transferring custody between families is actually quite easy, and it's allowed. Children get lost quite frequently in Canada. Mary Ellen Terpelafond is BC's representative for children and youth. The rehoming policy goes back decades designed to help families in crisis. Her concern today, the policy is being abused. Rehoming is not a legal concept. Really, it is a new thing that has developed where people make private arrangements to transfer children from one caregiver to another. Those transfers happen outside the system of protection for children. So um, I have deep concerns about this because um, it, it, it might be a very fancy way, a very comforting way of saying trafficking in children. Moses Gilbert's adoptive parents weren't trying to traffic him when they gave him away to a woman in Texas. In their minds, they were just transferring custody. While the rules may be vague about that, there's one rule that's crystal clear. You can't take a child across a border with the intent of leaving him there, not without the authorities being involved. And then there was the added problem that Moses was supposedly being monitored by BC's Ministry of Child and Family Development. By this point, he'd been on their caseload for three months, and yet it was a tip that alerted social workers to the fact he was gone. It then took them another month to apply to a Texas court to have him returned. Documents filed in that court hearing reveal the ministry knew a lot about Moses' life with the Johnsons. They also reveal startling information about the woman they'd handed him over to. It turns out Ambrosia Marvin has a troublesome history. Twice, according to the affidavit, she'd been investigated by Child Protective Services in Texas. It was an alarm bell for the B.C. social worker who swore the affidavit. But Ambrosia claims she has no idea what she's talking about. What were those investigations? I haven't had an investigation. CPS had never come to my house in Texas. Had you ever been questioned by CPS on, on anything that would... No. Every time I'm a teacher, I have to get fingerprinted. They find anything... It says nothing every time. This is an illegal document. She has sw this is sworn mm -hmm. testimony, and she says that this is what she's learned. So are you saying that, that she's wrong, that there was never an investigation No, I don't think she's wrong. I think she's being misleading, because the general opinion of Americans is that CPS isn't honest, and well. they will say what they want to get what they want. The social worker became even more suspicious when Ambrosia refused all efforts to visit her home and assess her as a potential parent. She told us she'd done all of that when she adopted her older son, and it was too invasive. I did not like the public agency because it didn't seem that anything you did was okay. What were you afraid of? I was not going to go down the same road that I went with my son. 
In the United States, we believe that the parents have the right. This was Moses. This was their child, the Johnsons. He was not the property of the Canadian government. People are going to watch this, and they're going to ask questions. They're sure. going to say, what kind of a person posts a child on the Internet, like a, an animal or a piece of furniture? They're also going to ask, what kind of a person accepts a child place that well, way. Well, I think a desperate parent posts them. And then, like I said, what kind of person accepts them? Well, we know kids have gone to pedophiles. Their parents just dropped them off and never looked back. But is that what we did? No. But Ian Johnson did just drop Moses off. He never saw Ambrosia's home. He didn't even stay a weekend. So what was the hurry? That affidavit filed in Texas court revealed something else. One week before Moses disappeared from Castle Gar, there was a meeting. Ministry social workers told the Johnsons that after weeks of monitoring, they'd concluded Moses was being emotionally harmed in their home, and steps would be taken to find him a safer one. The social workers didn't even get the chance. Within days, Moses and his father were gone. So why run when they had the option of turning Moses over to the ministry? And they had told you that they were going to find another home for Moses. They were going to take him out of this home and find another home for him. Why didn't you just let them I, do that? I don't know why. My wife didn't trust him. That was the main reason. We didn't want ministry taking him from us. That's why we did it. We know that they concluded that he was at risk emotionally in this home. I don't know what the, the risk was, whether because we weren't, I don't know what we did, but you know, we're just regular people. We're not abusers. We've never ever spanked or hit any of our children. We literally panicked, and the, my wife was just really stressed at the time, and we... So it's uh, better to turn him over to a woman you've never met? Well, I don't know. See, that's bad. I know. I, I can't argue with you on that. Was it a mistake? Uh, probably. Well, now that he's sitting where he is, you know, I have to, just looking logically, he's, a, he's, if he's flourishing where he is, He's a better off. The story I've heard is that they they posted something on the internet. And they were looking for somebody to take you because they felt they couldn't deal with you anymore. How does that make you feel? It doesn't make me feel very good. I feel a bit sad. It's sad because it's wrong to do things that are not right to other people especially if they can't say anything about it, and if they can't do anything about it. It's kind of scary a lot of the time. You know what's happening. I was just a young person, so. What were you scared of? I was scared of what I was scared of wasn't gonna have a family. When we come back, Moses finds a family at last. so many reasons Moses Gilbert should not be the normal, thriving 13-year-old that he is. Taken to an orphanage at four, adopted by foreigners at four and a half, labeled a problem by that family, who then posted him on the internet and gave him away. Moses was returned to Canada by court order, but for the next two years he bounced between foster homes before finally landing in Cowichan Bay with Dave and Kathy Gilbert. He was seven when we first met him, and he um, he was living in a group home setting with rotating staff, and he knew that he needed a family. He, this is this child that had experienced all these things, and so he was very thoughtful. Um, he was never a child that could smile on command. It was almost like he needed to learn to be happy in a way that people are happy in a family life. And it's hard to imagine a family more happy and full of love than this one. The Gilberts have adopted 12 children over the years, six of them from adoptions that failed. Yeah, um, that. The boy the Johnsons described as disruptive and violent, they came to know as a kid who needed love and a sense of security. 
Come on, Murphy. It took him time to trust us and believe that we were there for the long haul. And I think it took a lot of time to heal. Yeah. And some blackberry bushes, too. Probably blackberry bushes somewhere, too. In the five years they've had Moses, the Gilberts have never asked too many questions about what actually happened in Texas. We shared the results of our investigation, the documents we found, the details we learned about that night Moses was handed over at the hotel. You know, as Moses' mother and someone who loves him terribly, I just um, can't believe that someone could do that. It's unbelievable that anybody could be that inhumane with their child, with a little boy, with a five-year-old child. How can anybody think that that scenario is okay? It's, uh, people wouldn't do that with, with an animal, with a dog. You don't have any sympathy? Not really, no. But they have even less sympathy for the BC ministry. Social workers knew the family was struggling and had come to conclusions about Moses' safety. This is a child that, that they've been involved with for months, um, have known about, have helped the family, refer the family to services, and, um, and this says he's in need of protection, and yet he's still there until he disappears. Clearly, they should have taken him out of that home well before they have this meeting in October. And then there's the question of repercussions. While everyone agrees what Ian and Carol Johnson did was wrong, possibly illegal, no charges were ever laid. I find it hard to believe that somebody could actually take a child to another country and leave them there and return to the country and not face any consequences. It just seems wrong. In, in working through the recommendations both... We wanted to interview BC's Minister of Child and Family Development to ask Stephanie Cadieu why Moses wasn't removed from the Johnsons' home earlier and why no one was ever charged. The ministry refused to give us any information citing the family's right to privacy. This is a legitimate issue. We need to talk about this. For children's advocate Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond, that's not good enough. There are so many lessons to be learned from Moses' story, she says. The government shouldn't avoid accountability. Adoption should not be trafficking of children. We know that. And a case like this just speaks volumes about how it's far too easy, uh, and we need to learn any lessons we can from this to make sure it doesn't happen again. In the United States, the conversation about regulating the rehoming of children is starting to happen. This is, something that had, this is an area that had been, um, you know, largely um, unregulated. This summer, Reuters reporter Megan Tui testified before Congress. Since her reports, Yahoo has shut down its rehoming chat sites, but other internet companies apparently still allow them although now they're harder to access. What we've heard from people in the rehoming world is that this activity, while a lot of these groups have been shut down, the activity is just continuing further out of sight, further underground. And I think that it'll be interesting to see what happens moving forward if these people, if the people in Washington are going to put their money where their mouth is and, you know, actually uh, enact any meaningful reform. You get a slider rock and then you yep. can flick it up like that. You have to flick it up. As for Moses, who knows the mind of any 13-year-old boy, let alone one who has endured so much? More than anything, he said he always wanted a family. That much, at least, he now has. There's no way of knowing what difference his life would have made if we had been the ones to bring him from Liberia or if he'd never left Liberia or, you know, there's no way of, of knowing that. But if we don't give kids a chance at a family, then what are we as people? The kids deserve an opportunity to have people to belong to. We wanted him to have that chance. Oh yeah, it skipped.